A very good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, today, we've got a special guest, uh, somebody that I admire and I've admired for a very long time. Your Worship. Well, now you are Your Worship, right? Uh, thank you very much. I don't much really for like the title. Sometimes I say, you know, if you call me Your Worship, you get shot at dawn, but we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll pass over that for now. Okay, so, so I can call you David. Absolutely. All oh, right. Okay. Fantastic. So I've been given the leeway, so I will uh, indulge on it. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to your home. Lovely home, lovely environment. Uh, Zwerio has a, a special place in a lot of our hearts because when we, whenever we come here, we sort of, you know, we we can we we ease up and we take it all in, and it's it's a, it's a lovely environment. I describe it as the world's best kept secret. Uh, you know, it's a magnificent city. Yeah. Um, it, it's got a relaxed pace, but we've got everything here. Good schools, good hospitals. Mm. Matopa's just down the road, um, close to South Africa, close to Botswana. Uh, if we could just sort out the road and the railway line, uh, <laughs> it, it would be fantastic. We can get industry going. And that's really what I wanted to talk about, because part of the remit of why we came here is because we were in Arari, and we were arguing and debating on why the industrialization has stopped in in Bloyo, because if you read history, when uh, Cecil Rhodes settled here, uh, this was you know back in 1890. Well, he didn't settle, but when he took over uh, the country, uh, the industry was primarily here, based in Bloyo, right through to the Federation years, and even during UDI, mm -hmm. industry was extremely strong mm -hmm. here. Uh, some of our big companies like CSC, mm -hmm. uh, you know, beef industry, we're talking just about how lovely the beef is yeah it's just a different kind of sweetness that you get um and so there's something beautiful about this there's something industrious about uh Blueo, but we look at what's happening uh most industry is now in Harare, and not much activity is happening what are your perspective what happened to Blueo? so i think historically certainly until the 50s Blueo was actually bigger than harare it had a greater population and that came from its position, uh, closer to South Africa, closer to Botswana, uh, closer by rail to, to Zambia. Mm -hmm. And it was the pivot of the country. It was the logical place for, for industry uh, to be. Mm -hmm. um, also, after the Second World War, we, we had an influx of, of Jewish people. And they right. drove industry. And there, there was a huge Jewish community in the city, two synagogues, a Jewish mm -hmm. community of 3,000 people highly industrious people, and most of the industries actually were, were Jewish uh, initiated. Oh, I didn't know this. Mm. And then, you know, the Jewish people generally left, sadly. Okay, um, why did they leave? Well, they, I think they started to leave in the 1970s when the war started. Okay. Uh, that was anathema to them. Uh, many of them actually were very progressive people. They didn't yeah. agree with UDI, and uh, they didn't like what was happening, and so they left, and then left with you know, many in the white community in droves in the 1980s. But it, mm. that, so that was the start of the decline. And then it was compounded by the centrist policies of Zanu PF, which concentrated... So this is post Post-independence, yeah. Okay. Concentrated all power in... W in would Harari. you not say that was the same uh, under Ian Smith? No, not really. Okay. There, there was far more devolution under the RF, as, as bad as the RF was. They, they did allow, ironically, that amount of devolution. Uh, businesses could function here. They could get the, the permits they needed to from uh, Bulawayo without having to go to Harare. But when ZANU-PF started centralizing power, if you wanted to get a permit, if you wanted to get approvals, you would get, have to go to Harare. And then there was a political component as well. Okay. And, and that was what happened in the 1980s here, where basically development assistance which was flowing into the country, was cut off to this region. It's demonstrated in the rural roads here. If you try to drive to Nkai or Nkezi or Chilocho, you'll see roads that are still the same as they were in the 1950s, whereas mm. in the north of the country, uh, there was huge development aid. And that undermined industry here. And one by one, companies started moving their headquarters uh, to Harare, and c it continues. This year, Edgar's has yeah, moved yeah. its headquarters to Harare. Time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so the show is actually sponsored by Dairyboard. They were kind enough to give us their lovely juice. Uh, and I'm going to share it with you. Great. If you don't mind. Yeah. 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 Um, so while we do this, uh, so what do we need to do? 
because this is a new generation and we, you know, Bloyo is in our hearts, just as Muntara is and Gweru. And, you know, we were discussing just before the show that both of us are somewhat classical liberals mm -hmm. and we believe in devolution. We believe in power within the the local areas rather than it being uh, centralized. Well, so so my passion would not necessarily be with my land or with the city of Loero, but it would be with Mashingo, for example, or Chipinge or wherever uh, across the so Zimbabwe. So let me use cricket as an analogy. Those of you who follow me know that I'm passionate about Zimbabwe cricket. And mm -hmm. at present, I'm waging a bit of a war against Zimbabwe cricket because uh, virtually all the major uh, games are played in Harare. And this isn't about Bulawayo, just about playing cricket in Bulawayo. It's also about spreading the game to Motari, to Kwekwe, to Gweru. And you can only do that if you take a conscious step to devolve power and to ensure equity right across the country. Uh, so what happens in cricket needs to happen in business. We need to ensure, for example, not just in Bulawayo, but in Motari, Gweru, Kwekwe, that businesses, for example, can apply for permits, that there's genuine devolution of power, mm -hmm. and that they don't have to go to Harare. We also need a fundamental change in some of our policies. Let me turn to the city. Okay. You know, this city uh, was had visionary city fathers. They built uh, our own dams. They built five dams, and using ratepayers' money. And they were completely self-funded. They didn't rely on central government. But in the 1980s, government changed that. They took over all the dams, and now we have to buy our water from Zinwa. Mm. The same with Zinara. Electricity. Yeah. yeah. Electricity. It was we had localized. Our, we had our yeah. own power station here. With roads, when you paid your car license fees, the money came to the city of Bulawayo. Now it goes to Zinara, and we have to literally beg to get that money back. So there's a raft of policies that need to, to, to change. Because you worked in government, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into that, but I want to make a distinction that is the problem the bureaucracy? Because when you look at Zinara and uh, uh, the local authorities and everything that's happening with water, electricity, there's the bureaucracy and then there's a policy levels. Is the centralization or the affinity for centralization, is it at policy level with the politicians or it's with the bureaucracy? Well, I can't really answer that. I, I'm a lawyer, not an economist. I don't <laughs> fully. But for me, the problem is one of control. Okay. That you want to keep all control uh, so that you govern the entire country and you don't allow autonomy. Unfortunately, there's an element of corruption that is involved in that regard as well. If you have control, if you place obstacles in the path of people trying to do business, Mm -hmm. uh, that creates opportunities for arbitrage. And so I think it's, it's, I think it probably started off under Mugabe as simply a control mechanism. Mm -hmm. and you create the, the bureaucracy <clears throat> to, to suit that ideological objective. And then as time has progressed, I think that control has been a, a very useful precursor to arbitrage mm -hmm. and, and, and corruption. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Um, so let's talk about the young people that are growing up in Borrell, a lot of them are now going to South Africa. Uh, a lot of them are in the diaspora, but they have an affinity for their, you know, their region and for their city. Mm -hmm. What can they do to contribute as the diaspora? What do they need to do to actually get involved in what is happening in your city? Well, of course, it's not just young people. They're, <laughs> they're entire uh, generations that That's from true. the city have gone. And one of the refreshing things I've experienced in the last year since taking office is the many approaches from people in the diaspora who, who want to assist in the reconstruction of, of Bulawayo. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that's the one thing that you can do, just indicate your interest. For okay. younger people, though, what I often say is go and get as much experience as you can. Mm. Don't lose your passion for your country, for your city. Get as much experience in the business environment there. But always keep your eye on home so that you come back as soon as possible. It's difficult for young people to come back now because jobs are scarce. Um, but I have, no, I have great passion for this country and I, and I have great hope in its future. Mm -hmm. um, I often say to my own kids, uh, you know, my generation has to go because mm -hmm. unfortunately my generation is poisoned by the war 
and that poison will persist in our society. But when we all retire, I think this country is going to boom. You know, your okay. generation, yeah, your yeah. age, I think are going to utterly transform this country. It's going to be unrecognizable in, in my view. Well, we, we, we're starting to lose faith. <laughs> well, Maybe it's because we are now middle-aged. I don't know. What, what, what are your views on this? Because we, we, we're so, starting to lose, uh, especially you my know, we generation. We were discussing prior to the, to the interview. Uh, yeah, yeah. You were saying 20 years ago, you know, how have my perspective changed? Change? I think when I was in my 40s, I thought it was a sprint. I, and I realize it's a marathon. Okay. okay. I, and what I'm describing is the, the process of transition to democracy and to the civil liberties or mm. civil libertarian you know, principles, principles that perhaps yeah, yeah. we both share, even though I'm on your left today. <laughs> um, but, but the point is that it is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, and we can look to other countries to see that if you hang in there, if you never give up, mm. uh, ultimately, this country has so many inherent strengths and beauties. Uh, it's not Sudan. It's not Somalia. It's not a desert. It, it actually has the, you know, the most amazing assets, principally our people, mm. but also in our geography and our mineral resources and our tourist facilities, that it's got a base from which we can rebuild. The critical thing is to maintain the cause, particularly institutions. Okay. We've got to at least maintain the core of an institution so that there's something to, to build on. Mm. So I'm, I'm not pessimistic at okay. all. Okay, all right. Uh, and if people want to invest in the city, uh, are there any particular areas you think are good? So investment you know, I've areas? been thinking, how, I've been trying to reimagine how do we get the city functioning again? And mm. you know, we were talking about the industrial areas. And the, the world has moved on from 40 years ago. We're not going to get the clothing manufacturers that we used to have in the city because it's very difficult to compete with Bangladesh, with, with India, with China. They have economies of scale that we can't hope to, to match. So, so how do we reimagine the city? What, what is the low, the low hanging economic fruits? And I put, it, put them down to two areas. Mm -hmm. Number one actually is in tourism. The, right. This city, this region is completely undermarketed. Um, if you look at tourist arrivals to Victoria Falls, even to Harare compared to here, we are way down. We get, mm. If you fly up from Johannesburg to Bulawayo, you'll find returning residents, re returning citizens, and minors generally. Okay. Very few yeah. tourists. So tourism is the low-hanging fruit. Um, I was out in the Metopolis last weekend. There are unimaginable beauties out there. That's, that's true. Aside yeah. from, you know, the rocks and the trees, you've got uh, rural people, these women who paint their houses. They, they are absolutely spectacular. You know, mm. tourists will come flooding in if that's properly marketed and if they can get here easily. So tourism, tourism is number one. Okay. Number two comes back to young people. We've got to consider this unique asset that we've got and our unique mm. position. We're in the same time zone as Europe. We've right. got yeah, yeah. young people who are well-educated, who are well-mannered, and critically, who are understandable. <laughs> Absolutely. And <laughs> you know, multilingual. Multilingual. Actually, uh, and and Africa, gentle can, and sense yeah, of yeah. humor. And, you know, we must be able to compete with India. We should Absolutely. far be able to outstrip India. So, you know, I look at some of these empty factories and say, couldn't we have thousands of young people in call centers? That's, that's mm. number two. And then number three, of course, is the, the old industries that, that were there, okay. that are, are still there, but really struggling. There's, there are a couple of things that we need to do. For example, the road from Bightbridge to Victoria Falls is critical. The railways are critical. We've, we've got to have that connectivity. And there's a unique opportunity if you see what's happening, for example, in Kaateng. Mm -hmm. Kaateng's ru running out of water. They're running That's out true. of land. And here we sit with land galore, uh, railway sidings, massive factories, if we can secure water, and we can, um, adequate supplies of water, and this proximity to, to Gauteng. So I, I see looking south mm. as a critical component in attracting perhaps South African business to, to relocate here. That's right, and especially where you're actually located uh, as a network node, whether it's rail or road, 
you know. Absolutely. Uh, Let's talk about network nodes. You know, uh -huh. uh, Starlink is now approved here. And <laughs> I put out on Twitter, and I've, I'm now in touch yeah, with yeah. Starlink. Oh, are you? Yeah. So tell us a little bit more well, about to that. Well, and well done. You, you, you want to that. have a, a SADAC ground station? Come to our city. You know, here we yeah. are. Position, position, position. Why did they put the headquarters here? Absolutely. Of the railways. Absolutely. You know, because of its position. But look, we're a long way off that. No, it's the uh, being innovative and the initiation. Abs I think that is what is important, absolutely. especially from our city fathers. You know, if you look at Ramaphosa mm. this week, met Elon Musk. Uh, Elon Musk born changer. in South Africa. Potential game changer. Mm, true. Uh, and we're just north of the border. And, and social media, that's just how powerful social media is. I think that uh, government, as well as business and all the industries, need to just realize just how powerful social media yeah, is absolutely. and how it's just connecting everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to talk to uh, the local businesses that are already in Loeo. What could you do as the city fathers? What could you do in terms of incentives or just encouraging them to stay here and to actually increase the output? Because I know they're quite a number and they would love to hear what... Look, potentially in, can in, do in my discussions with CZI, for example, and CZI in, in the city is bleeding. There, there are many mm. businesses right on the edge, and their main plea to us is on rates, Okay, uh, to, to do what we can to lower rates. Our problem is that we work in this national macro environment, mm -hmm. and we are obliged to charge rates in US and in ZIG. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is that up until yesterday, of course, uh, that ZIG was half its actual value. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, makes it uh, impossible to it run a city. It makes it virtually yeah. impossible to run a city like this because naturally, if the ZIG is at an unrealistic rate, people will pay in ZIG, which distorts your US dollar pricing. Mm. And it gives us very little fiscal space in which to, to move navigate. With industry. Yeah, but, yeah. but that's the number one key. Uh, for, for business. Okay, all right. Okay, so thank you very much for this. Uh, the second half of this, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, your time in government because you did something that obviously I would never do, but you're on my left side. So you're more interested in working in government and uh, in politics and actually thinking that you can change the state. I don't think one can actually effect change, but you're one of those ministers where we can attribute some sort of change that you did, especially during the GNU years, and more particularly education. And I'll give our audience, uh, just for context, and also for yourself, because I don't know if you realized uh, just the impact of GNU and uh, education, is 2009, if you look at the number of kids that were actually in school, uh, and you look at contribution of education to our GDP, by the time you left in 20, 2013, uh, education was contributing about 6% to our GDP. That's round about what tourism contributes. That's 3% less than what agriculture contributes. That's you know 2% less than what mining contributes. Mm -hmm. So that was quite significant. But unfortunately, over the last decade, so if you look at 2013 and 2023, the latest numbers are that education now contributes only 2% of, uh, of GDP. 25% of the kids that are supposed to be in schools or that used to be in school, mm -hmm. are no longer in school. Mm -hmm. So there's been lack of investment mm -hmm. in education. But I think that's something that where your impact was felt. And I just want you to just walk through what you guys actually did and why you actually believed that you could make the changes. So before I actually tackle your question, mm -hmm. um, let, let me deal with the fundamental. What we need to understand, if we study economics right across the world, you'll see that a good education sector is the most important component in long-term sustainable economic development. Take Singapore, for example. What transformed Singapore from where it was in the 1950s, early 1960s, to where it is today? Take Shanghai. Take uh, Finland, for example. These were all relatively poor countries. And what separates all of them out is that they made education an absolute priority from a budgetary perspective. And not just a theoretical budget, the actual budget, the actual amount of money that they, they, they spent. spent. Okay. They also great, gave great respect to teachers. You know that in Singapore, if you want to do an education degree, you've got to get the top results at secondary school level. Right. Okay. Uh, the results that we take for medicine or engineering, they require for education. 
and then they respect their teachers after they graduate. They're paid well. In Finland, mm. you can't teach grade one without a master's degree. That's a fact. So, and if you look at all those those economies, there there is a correlation. But it took a, a decades long commitment of governments, and it was nonpartisan. It was a national commitment to education. We started off on that track in the 1980s, mm. um, but we've totally lost our way, particularly in the last 10 years. Totally lost our way, and it is. It is the, the most serious component about our politics today. But coming to, to, to your question, when I came in, the education sector w was in chaos. Um, in February 2009, uh, we, we had 8,000 schools closed, basically. We had 109,000 teachers basically on strike. The public examinations, which had been written the previous November, hadn't even been marked in February. So it was in absolute chaos. 20,000 teachers left in 2006, 2007, 2008. So how did we turn that, that around? Mm. It, fundamentally, it was honest dialogue with the trade unions. One of the first things I did was to bring, bring the trade unions into a meeting with Tendai Beatty. Okay. Literally, Tendai Beatty, myself, and the trade union leaders. And we explained the nature of the economy. Mm. Tied into that, we had to show them... But these were your friends. Sure. Mm. Yeah. But we had to show them that we were all in this together. And what, what did we do? Two things. My first salary as a minister was 100 bucks yes. a month. And that lasted quite a long time. So we were able to look the guys in the eye and say genuinely, we're all in this together. As you know, I turned down Mercedes. I, I could not contemplate going to a meeting with trade unionists in a, a brand new Mercedes and tell them to tighten their belts. How important was that gesture? It, it was hugely symbolically important just to say, look, we need to get you back. We can't pay you the salary initially uh, mm. that, that you, you deserve, but we need you back in the classroom. We then also declared an amnesty for the 20,000 teachers who had left to get them back in. All right. And yeah. they came And they came. 15,000 teachers came back. Unfortunately, about 5,000 stayed in South Africa as waiters mm -hmm. and in their tourist sector, but 15,000, okay. um, you know, came, came back. And then finally, I reestablished something called the National Education Advisory Board. And mm -hmm. I brought the trade union leaders onto that board, along with other key educationists. Okay. And not one single uh, policy that I implemented was implemented prior to obtaining their advice mm. and their consent. So when we implemented a policy, it had broad consensus. Okay. Compare that to what we're doing now, where we've been detaining uh, trade union leaders, teacher trade mm. union leaders. Uh, okay. And and this very hostile uh, uh, approach to teachers, and you know, you know, in business, um, most of our most successful businesses operate because there's a dynamism. It has to be there. You know, yeah. people. You need buy-in from. You need buy-in from from anyone, yeah, and yeah. and that applies to a ministry. Okay, as, so as well. so the trade unions, the buy-in. Uh, who else was a big stakeholder that had to buy into your vision? Well, it was mainly the the. The, the trade, trade unions, because that's the teachers and of course the I, okay. I had to have a consensus with Robert Mugabe. And tell us about that. Yeah, so I mean, that's well, interesting. Well, he's a teacher, so I think he's he a teacher, a, and you know I think he was skeptical about me, okay. and I was skeptical about him. So it started off very tense, mm. but then I think what does tense look like? Try and help us. You know, we've never been in government. Well, so. well you know, it, it, if you were interviewing Mr. Putin now, you wouldn't be quite as, <laughs> as, as relaxed, okay? And Mr. Putin wouldn't be very relaxed with you. True. Um, so it, it was a strained conversation. It was... Okay. Um, uh, because of your politics. politics. Oh, okay. all right. Okay. okay. Um, but that changed over five years. I mean, it took a long time. Mm. But actually, uh, the, the communication started fairly quickly. I think two things happened. Firstly, uh, despite the fundamental differences of opinion we, we had, I think we both understood 
that we did in fact have children at, at heart. Wow. Mugabe, for all his faults, me, for all my faults, we both recognized in each other that. And, and once we established that, that understanding, mm -hmm. um, I would ask Mugabe for a meeting that would be granted instantly. Okay. It was amazing. T give, us, yeah. you know, give us a bit of color. Uh, tell us some, about something that you was very difficult to get outside of the president's office. And then when you went in and you spoke to him and he so opened the, the doors. You know, the best example was um, in the whole process around the textbook procurement exercise. Okay. We wanted to get textbooks back into schools. We were dealing with three publishing houses and there was a cartel. They were charging for their textbooks way above what we felt was the, the proper commercial value. Mm -hmm. I worked very closely with UNICEF and we took quite a bold decision with UNICEF. And we decided that we were going to go to commercial tender. Uh, historically, one publisher would supply, for, for example, maths, another geography, and it was a very comfortable arrangement for them. They all got a slice of the cake and it was a cartel there. And we decided, now we're going to go to commercial tender. And if that commercial tender results in the allocation of the entire tender to one publisher, so be it. Okay. We worked very carefully. It was done under the auspices of the United Nations and the tender process was done in Copenhagen. I made sure that there was a huge amount of distance between myself and the tender process. UNICEF handled it. The tender happened and it was granted to one publishing house. Okay. Mm. And that publishing house was owned by the same company that had supplied textbooks to Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> Interesting. So the element in the other text um, publishing houses and even within Zanu PF said, aha, this minister, we, you know, we've got something to hang him on. Mm. This minister is involved in a regime change <laughs> exercise. Using uh, textbooks. Using textbooks. <laughs> They're going to subvert the minds of our kids. Uh, the same publishing house, you know, went into Iraq and Afghanistan, and it became a huge issue. The Herald got involved, and it became a cabinet issue. Mm -hmm. All the daggers came out against me. There was a major debate in cabinet, and Mugabe listened to this entire debate. And at the end of the debate, he, he said very quietly, he said, but hold on, two things. Wasn't the tender process done by UNICEF in Copenhagen and the minister had nothing to do with it? And secondly, isn't it correct that all the textbooks are the same textbooks we've been using for 20 years? From our own From our, writers. Our, yeah. our, our own writers. So where's the conspiracy? Killed the debate stone dead. And it's, wow. you know, it's a fascinating example. And that was a game changer. An absolute in... game changer. It, it meant that the textbook program went ahead. Hmm. By breaking the cartel, we saved $10 million, which wow. then provided us money to do not just the primary school textbooks, but the secondary school textbooks as well. Wow. Yeah. So it was a game changer. And prior to this, you didn't have uh, a chat with him? To, to Look, so we that we had this or he incredibly just... strained relationship. I mean, okay. when I was involved in the Legal Resources Foundation in, in the 1990s, and we produced Breaking the Silence, the, the seminal report on Kokorohundi, he accused Michael Redd, the head of the Catholic Commission for Justice and Peace, and me, of being regime change agents, you know, seeking to destabilize the entire state. In 1999, he went to national television, mm. named us personally. So that was the background to the relationship. It, it, it wasn't, you know, particularly cordial. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, but where I'm going with this is this reconciliation of people who are not friends but are able to work together and are able to admire one another and to see something that is rationally possible and go with it. Um, and I'm trying to speak to, was it a lot to do with Mugabe's persona and who he is as a person or just the political times of that particular epoch? I think it was a combination. I think it had to do with Mugabe. And, and in my case, Mugabe had a passion for education. He was a highly intelligent man. He was a teacher himself. He knew the the importance, the value of education. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, ha had I been uh, Minister of Justice or something like that, I, I don't think we would have had had okay. the same rapport. So I think that, that that was cool. 
But I think also the wider political environment, the, the fact that SADC and the AU was backing the GNU, that they wanted wins, and then the international community as well responded. You know, we raised half a billion dollars for education. Explain, explain, explain that. How, how did you manage so to do that? So, obviously, it's a lot easier when you trying to raise money for children. You tend to push against an open door. I've experienced that now as mayor. You know, mm. it's far, it was far easier to raise international finance okay. uh, for children than it is for other causes. So why, why is it very difficult to raise money now? Um, well, I think that Zimbabwe has a very sour relationship now with the West. Okay. Even worse then. I think... Really? I thought, I thought, you know, our relations had improved and... No, during the GNU, there was hope. Uh, there was a progression towards a new constitution. The, the hope was that this was a settling of the country, uh, a step in the road towards democracy. Uh, there weren't as many people being detained. Uh, there weren't soldiers out in the street shooting people. Uh, and, and so that, that led to a far more conducive in, environment. But there was another key thing that, that, that I did. And I consented to donor money going direct from the donor to the affected communities mm. to bypass whole swathes of, of bureaucracy. So, for example, with the textbook program, um, the international community paid the publishers direct. We organized distribution direct with the um, schools development fund as well. We yeah. identified at grassroots level, literally, uh, whether schools needed to re-roof a, uh, a classroom block. And okay. the money went direct to the school development committee. Okay, and that worked really well. That's fantastic. Okay, so uh, just to wrap up, something that you and I are going to disagree on, uh, and I'm looking forward to hear what your answer to this is. So the idea of free education. Uh, why should a parent who can afford to send their kids to school? So here I'm not talking about kids in the rural areas talking about kids in the cities where parents can afford, they do buy alcohol, and they should be able to pay for their kids' education. Why should our state, in opposition as well as in government, why is it there's this thrust for free education? So you're going to be very disappointed because I actually agree with you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no, I... Because I've read the, 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 the Triple C, M MDC yeah, Manifesto, so, sure. and they talk about yeah. free education. I understand that. And it's, it's mm. unrealistic. Okay. okay. So, right. so my view, and I'm a lawyer, I'm not an educationist, but I had five years in the education ministry, so I've got a reasonable understanding. Okay. Um, you, you, you have to have a variety of education products. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at my time in ministry, one principle that underpinned my policy was autonomy. To devolve power down to, uh, to teachers, to headmasters, to school development committees, and to allow the private education sector to flourish. Don't, don't interfere with them. As long as you set the parameters and the standards, let private education flourish. Don't try and interfere. Let the market determine. Mm. So if people mm. want to pay outrageous amounts to send their, their kids to one school, let that happen. Let it be. At, at, yeah. at one end of, end of the spectrum. But at the other end of the spectrum, you do have to provide, based on a means test, okay, mm -hmm. free education. Because we have children of single mothers, we have children, we have orphans who, who can't afford education. And at that end of the spectrum, you do have to have um, free education for, for those children. But it's a limited number. You know, one of the policies that I implemented, if you go back, okay. um, we couldn't pay teachers a viable wage. They, they were paid a lot more than they are now, but mm. we couldn't pay them the wage that they uh, wanted to. And, and so I allowed incentives. Oh, okay. I, I allowed parents, even in the poorest communities, if they wanted to band together to pay incentives, and it, it actually worked very well. Right. Um, so it, it, it's a mix. Um, right. You might be disappointed that I allow some, I believe, in some free education. <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, and it shouldn't be under the Ministry of Education. I think it should be under the Ministry of uh, uh, Social Services. 
So that th there should be a separation of just how uh, a, a particular school actually runs. And those that cannot afford, mm -hmm. it shouldn't really involve the Ministry of Education. It should involve uh, public service yeah. or social but services. But once again, you know, we have to follow best practice. Okay. I come back to the investment in education. Mm. Okay. If you look at Singapore, if you look at Finland, if you look at... I use Shanghai, not the whole of China, but Shanghai. Yeah. Shanghai's education is outstanding. Yes. Central government has poured money into education, poured money into the construction of good schools and whiteboards. Mm. Um, the infrastructure. The, the, yeah, the yeah. infrastructure to make sure that it's top rate in infrastructure. And, and government can never avoid that responsibility. In fact, I believe that that is arguably the most critical investment in the future economy of, of, mm. of the state. But once you've done that, invest, allow um, parents to, to invest in education. Okay, fantastic. Then the last thing is about, um, okay, so the producer is jumping up and down, but I think it would be remiss if I don't talk about this. So if you just allow me just one minute, uh, the color, the syllabus, the new syllabus, what are your thoughts about it? Education 5.0. What do you think? So the moment I see heritage education, I see a political component to it. And okay. you've got to take partisan politics out of education. Leave it mm. to the educationists. I deliberately, I'm a politician. I don't want to get involved in curriculum development. Okay. So that's number one. Number two, I don't see the consensus, the consultation. This is a top-down approach. I, I don't see the teachers have been involved in this. When I speak to teachers about the color program and and all of that, they, they hate it. They, mm. They're having to spend so much time in bureaucratic processes rather than in, in the classroom itself. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, on that note, uh, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed this. And I'm hoping that we continue this series because there's a lot that we need to just tear apart and get into the weeds, get into a rabbit hole session, sure. for example. Great. Yeah. But thank you so much. Eh? Pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Cheers.